In this video, we're going to look at different sampling guidelines to make sure that we're covering our population with our surveys. If we recall, we've got four primary types of survey error, what we call coverage error, sampling error, response error, and measurement error. Ideally, in a total survey error approach, we want to try and minimize all of these. And in our discussion of question order, question wording, and question design, we were focused mainly on response error and measurement error. We're going to touch on some principles that will deal with coverage error and sampling error. So for review, coverage error is what happens when the sample frame isn't accurate and therefore the estimate we get, the, the list we get, is not represented, re representative of the full population. So we would do much better with an accurate list. Coverage error, essentially that's what it is. You don't have a good list of your population. So when you're actually out there surveying them, you're not hitting the people you think you are. Sampling error is the difference when we don't get a good representation in our sample. We only get some units of our, of our population and it's not representative of the whole group. So two different types of error. Coverage error and sampling error. Different ways of trying to, to deal with them. So, for example, one consideration, we could ask the question, what sample frame is being used? Because the sample frame will inform our sample. A good, accurate sample frame lead to better quality samples. And then, of course, the type of sampling method. We're using random samples, we're using non-random samples. What, what are, exactly are we doing to sample our population? Because that will have its own set of uh, positives and negatives as well. So for starters, we'll just look at some different sampling frames. You want to ask about the sampling frame you're using. Now, if you're using phone surveys, there's a few different common sample frames. The sample frame might be a telephone directory. In a given city, in a given region, you could have access to a list of phone numbers, and that could be an example of, of a sampling frame that you might use for phoning households. Address-based sampling, same idea. You're, you're, you've got a directory, it's address-based, and then you use that to pull your sample from. And then random digit dialing, which is probably one of the most common sampling frames for phone surveys, and it's just essentially auto-dialing, so you can do a better job of, of catching folks with cell phones. Online sample frames, there aren't any. Uh, there is no big list anywhere of people that you can contact online to complete a survey. When you're dealing with web surveys, you've only got non-probability methods. So that's not great from a research perspective. Other alternatives, consumer data, membership lists, aren't all that good because they're not representative. So one of uh, a, a common way of getting data from uh, for an online survey is, is getting membership lists. So you might go to a market research firm and market research firm might have a list of people that bought a certain loyalty card. And you might want to use that as your, as your sampling frame. Well, again, that's very limited in scope. Um, YouGov, the, the polling agency, runs into this problem because they use a panel study. So that is a non-probability sample. It is not a, a representative of, of the entire population. And so you can't really make good generalizations based on that. So some considerations when evaluating potential sample frames. frames. Does it contain everybody? Is everybody in your population on that list? And it's difficult for us to find sample frames where that is the case, because inevitably there are errors. The telephone directories, for example, miss people with, with landlines. Does the sample frame include the names of people who are not in the population? So this could also be a byproduct of, of when you're trying to phone people and you're looking at uh, phone numbers in a directory. You could have a business or a residence that has multiple phone numbers going to the same household or business. So that way you would be hitting people more than once potentially. So you don't want your sample frame to have more than one people. You know, the, the Americans struggle with this with their voters list because they, they're notoriously tough to update and out of date. And so you get uh, folks that are left out and you get folks that are sometimes on twice because they're, they might register once with a middle name and once without a middle name. And so they, they have a horrible time trying to keep their voters' rolls up to date. So if you're using those as sampling frames, you could have either problem point one or point two there. 
Are there any units in, in the frame more than once? Again, same problem. You've got, uh, you, you could have multiple entries for folks. And then how is the frame maintained and updated? So you want a frame that you know has decent data. Elections Canada here in, in, in Canada does a great job of keeping the, uh, the voters' rolls up to date. So that could be a good sampling frame if you're looking to do some voter outreach and surveys of voters. Probability sampling. When you've got your sample frame, it's a good list, and you decide that you want to move forward with your, your survey, probability sampling is uh, it's the gold standard. We want to have probability samples. Every member of your sample frame has a chance of being included. So uh, the wording here, it's a given, known, non-zero chance. Everybody on the list has a chance of being selected. So whatever method you're using for, for pulling people out of that sample frame, everybody has some chance. So that is what you want. That is true probability sampling. By doing that, by getting a probability, a random sample, it allows us to make generalizations about the population. That's just the nature of, uh, uh, of statistics. We get a decent random probability sample where everybody's got an equal chance of being selected. We can make good generalizations about our population. Different types of samples and I'm going to outline a couple. For example, the simple random sample. Every member has an equal chance of, of getting included. Now some samples, some types of sampling, not everybody has an equal chance. It might be known, might be non-zero, but it might not be equal. In a simple random sample, everybody has an equal chance of being included. They're going to be selected randomly and independent of one another. So in this graphic, what we've got is our population from 1 to 12 being lined up regardless, irrespective of characteristic. They're lined up in a row, and we're just randomly picking people. And so then we can see our sample drawn from the population. Number of different variations on simple random samples. We can have some samples that aren't so simple. For example, the systematic random sample. This is when you have a population, and again, you would line it... In, uh, in no particular order, so you, in this case, again, you see from 1 to 12 just lined up in uh, with, with no, no purpose, no order. And you would pick somebody systematically. You would pick somebody according to some sort of predetermined interval or ratio or order. So the, the example here is you would pick every third person. So if you're doing interviews out, out front of a Walmart, a systematic random sample would say you're going to grab every third person. Or every year you're doing a door-to-door -door survey, you're going to grab every third household, something like that. So that would be an example of a, of a systematic sample. Stratified random sample. This is a random sample, but you're using some direction to guide your efforts and to hit targets within the population. So, for example, you might organize your population in what are called categories, strata, and hence the term stratified is where, is where we get it. And in this population, we've got the three characteristics, the white characteristic, the black characteristic, and the gray characteristic. You would group them because you might have a goal of targeting certain numbers from specific groups. Each category then in your stratified random sample would be, satis would be sampled as if it were an independent group. So you might have a goal of picking one from the white characteristic group, two from the black characteristic group, and then one from the gray characteristic group. We are notorious for doing this in Canada with Quebec. In pure, simple, random samples, Quebec often gets underrepresented. And that doesn't give us great data, especially for things like political and election polling. So what we do, and what the polling firms do, is conduct stratified random samples, where they will have the rest of Canada in one bucket and Quebec in another bucket. And they will have a, a target they want to hit of of, of of, of households or, or individuals from Quebec. And so that's how they will run their stratified random sample. The downside of that is we, we tend to oversample Quebec w when we do that. But you could imagine different reasons. You might want um, specific targets by age group or sex category. There's all kinds of different, uh, different reasons you might want to use a stratified random sample. Cluster sample. Another type of sampling when you organize your sample into groups. And so in this very simplified graphic, you can see it's just got pairs of people. One and two, three and four, and so on. 
and you choose as part of your sample clusters you choose entire groups so an example of this might be households or neighborhoods you might choose an entire street for for your sample to help give an illustration here's a type of cluster sampling a multi-stage cluster sample called area probability sampling and this is an example of uh, just sort of identifying a cluster and taking the whole thing so you might narrow down a narrow uh, a city a part of the city a neighborhood and then you might just sample everybody on that street that's an example of a, of a cluster sample uh, the area probability sampling you'll do the same thing you might identify a bunch of different states and then in each state you'll pick one county and then in each county you'll pick one city and then each city you'll pick one street and on each street you'll pick one household so that's uh, very common in, in field interviews, and that's a type of cluster sampling. So cluster sampling is you're, you're picking a group of something, a chunk of something. So you're, you're, you're grabbing things that are either proximal to one another or they're, they, they share some common characteristics, perhaps. So those are probability sampling. And probability because we have, we have an idea of how what the odds are of being selected. Increasingly, we're seeing more market research firms, polling firms, and researchers using non-probability methods, particularly in web surveys where you don't have sample frames. You've got to find another way of getting people because you can't do a simple random sample from an accurate sample frame. They don't exist. One of the problems, these have horrible participation rates when you're looking at online surveys and they exclude large numbers of people. So you could ask people to share with their, their social network a snowball sample. It's going to suffer through both of those problems. It's going to exclude lots of people. You're going to have low participation rates. Click through ads on surveys. Same thing. The panel studies that uh, that YouGov uses, you're going to exclude a lot of people from that. And therefore, you, you can't make generalizations. The last point there, you can't make generalizations to the population of interest. So non-probability sampling, if you remember the back at the beginning of the course, we talked about trade-offs between accuracy and, and cost. And so that's, here's a great example. You want to do something that's that's accurate, but at the same time, sometimes non-probability samples are just cheaper and easier. And so that's a decision you make as, as, you're, as you're weighing those considerations of how you want to cover your population. You want to have a probability sample, you want to have a non-probability sample. It's going to depend on, on your resources. So here's an example of how that breakdown happens. Convenience sampling, where you just grab the first X number of samples of individuals or households that you see or that you're able to get a hold of when you do that you're going to get large sections of the population left out and so here is a graphic that shows lots of different characteristics in a population there's a red characteristic a green one a pink one orange one and so on so in a convenient sampling you're just grabbing the first two rows of people that you encounter and if i'm going to look at that sample and try to make generalizations about the population i would be way off. For one, I would see that I've got a, a gray characteristic in my sample. And so I would deduce that, well, the gray characteristic must be prominent. As it must represent 5% of the total population. And that's not the case. I just happen to have the only gray characteristic in my sample. I might also look at my uh, sample and conclude that there are no yellow or orange characteristics in the population. Well, I'd be way wrong there as well, because Orange is, in fact, the most dominant characteristic. So convenient sampling, not good because you lose large chunks of the population and then you cannot make accurate generalizations. So in summary, your sampling frame, your sampling methods are going to impact those two sources of error, the coverage error and your sampling area. Are, are, are you covering the whole population that you think you are? And then is your sample decent enough that you're able to make generalizations? And then, of course, we've got the limitations of non-probability samples as well.